Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. All right, folks, let's go into our next interview or our next conversation, really. It's an interesting dance here on Conversations with Karalia, that difference between interviewing someone and allowing a conversation to unfold. And I feel like I'm still kind of mastering the difference between those two things. And I'm sure that over time, like once I get to say 20 odd or 30 or 40 or 100 of these conversations, that that style will really start to, to drop in. So coming up on the show today, I have Rebecca Gunson. And Rebecca is another friend of mine who I lived with for a period of time in West Auckland. And She's got an interesting journey, a really interesting journey. And what's curious too is that Rebecca learned the water ceremony from Melissa Billington, who I had on the show last week, of course. And when I realized that kind of connection, I was like, oh, I really want to talk to Rebecca about her experience of doing the water prayers in the ceremony. But I also wanted to talk to Rebecca about her experience of working within the mainstream in terms of uh, working within schools as a dance movement therapist. I'm pr not 100% sure if that's the term she uses. And then the realization that she had that she needs to work outside the system to do the most beneficial work. And I was really curious about that because as many of you will know, I have, um, you know, I've been going to festivals for years and a big part of festivals is using music and dance and chanting and yoga and meditation and sound journeys and all these different methodologies in order to support the resolving of trauma and to really bring us back in touch with our inherent aliveness, our inherent creativity and our inherent joy. So I have, you know, dreams or visions of these methodologies being used to support the healing of collective trauma, which I feel like at the moment, like we're post COVID and I just had this feeling like as a country of 5 million, there's so much unresolved, unprocessed trauma just from that particular event. Now there's other weather events coming in, adding to it. And I feel like as a population, we really need collective support to process things because there just is not enough capacity within our mental health services to do one-on-one -on -one therapy with everyone. So I knew that Rebecca and I would be able to have a really interesting conversation about her own journey of awakening, right? Because we're here to talk about awakening and liberation, the, the resolving of trauma and what she's noticed in the bodies of work that she has done. So as always, stick around for the whole conversation and I'll be back after we talk to do a little bit of a wrap up and a recap. All righty, let's see what Rebecca, uh, affectionately known as B, has to say. All righty, Rebecca, welcome to Conversations with Karalia. So epic to have you on the show. Where in the world are you right now? What have you been up to? Oh, wow. Well, currently I'm in a yurt in Whangaroa, Raglan, um, North Island of Aotearoa. And um, whew, been in a really deep process journey uh, with some amazing friends and um receiving a lot from an elder Mike O'Donnell um, that I have been blessed to spend time with and receive his medicine and his um, deep way that he relates to life and how he brings forth um, these amazing art pieces that are living vibrational beings that are here to awaken us and remind us of um, this whole journey here and the the scent into the underworld and the the, the, the parts of us that um, 
can feel locked and stuck and that journey of slowly unraveling and opening and coming up from those deep mm. waters and taking a breath and then being diving deep down like am I ready to actually really rise and be in this power and be in this level of awareness and openness and then there's four pieces that he's um been working on that then the fourth piece is then that rising up again like this fish bird being like flying and um and then a middle sculpture that just holds such potence about the um the hapu being pregnant and full with life and mm. and birth and so we are um on a bit of a yeah, on a bit of a wananga with with bringing these sculptures to Soulscape, um, mm -hmm. a which you know, and we've all been in um, beautiful festival and dance spaces with. And so we are um, establishing a sanctuary garden space up the top to hold them as they start to emerge and listening to the space to see how... Um, how it unravels and how we can be of service to others to then receive Mike's transmissions through these beings. So yeah, being every day up there singing, creating a beautiful and around them because it's dubscape at the moment. So there's a lot of music and movement and stuff going on and just deeply listening to how um, the whenua can hold them and how we can um, play to yaki and be um, yeah, in support of that space. So I'm, I, th I'm that I wasn't going to be here <laughs> for a weekend, but he has sent us on a bit of a mission, and so I'm going to be here to, for another week, and um, then head back to Waiheke Island where uh, I live, which is my base, and mm. yeah, just feeling a lot in my heart and deep humbleness and gratitude for uh, what learning and some. Yeah, it's been a beautiful process, which will be, be, you know, behind me and speaking to what we're speaking to. And um, mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, you know, you're talking about art, but you're also talking about a shamanistic world view. And it really feels like a convergence of understanding the journey that we humans go on with all of the stuff that comes up. Um, I know that you have recently been working in the mainstream system, bringing dance movement therapy to neurodiverse tamariki to support them in that role. And you've moved out of that mm. now. And I definitely want to talk about that. But before we do, mm. can you kind of track us back? Um, you <laughs> childhood, teenage years, university, what was the track that you were on? Was it typical? Was it normal? Was it weird and weird and out there? Weird and weird, weird and out there. <laughs> <laughs> um there's a lot of weird and out there <laughs> going on in my right now but I guess I I came from a farming family background in Hawke's Bay and um but such a love of nature and running horses and water skiing at Lake Tarawera and um going adventures with my dad and and my mum had a huge love of the ocean so she'd take us on beach holidays so I've always felt um, growing up as a kid in Aotearoa really yeah deeply connected to kind of that wild exploration and play um, but I found myself at a point where I felt um, limited or restricted by the circles that I was moving in and um, ended up going to university in Christchurch and then finishing my degree in Auckland and yeah, kind of a lot of the same story that some of us experience of like partying a lot and, and um, feeling once I started getting into yoga and being really aware of kind of what I was putting in my body that it's it was out of balance and I, I wanted more of the, the spiritual journey, the soul growth. So there was this slow kind of unlocking and opening and, and I feel like I was asking, is there more than this? Like show me whether that was subconsciously or consciously so um yeah that led me on quite a journey to uh going and going to Australia working in a retreat center there um feeling the power of meditation and mm. um going on big hikoi's in the bush and 
and listening because I was never really taught how to listen. Hmm. Um, you know, like on a, in a farming family background, you know, they're super amazing with working the land and I've grown up with grandmothers with amazing garden gardens, but there was always this separation between, you know, we work the land and, you know, this is what we're going to do today. And it was like very in that mental plane logical way, but there was not a lot of like awareness that we are so interwoven with our natural environment and that we mm. ask before we take these transmissions I've now received from indigenous teachers. And so it's been this kind of complete ro- reprogramming of how I see through uh, another lens. And um, yeah, Australia is a huge teacher for me living in Byron and starting to go to ecstatic dance and ceremonies and feeling this like incredible connection to a really um, alive tribe of people that were operating in other ways. And, and I, 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 I just needed also to really rest deep and settle into spaces of um, low sensory stimulation to start listening and attuning because I was working in hospitality and there was like this bipolar way of feeling like this bubbly energy that's like yeah what do you need and like giving out and smoking smoothies and and then just like to pause at the end of that day and going to the tea tree lakes and singing and coming back to learn how to regulate when I was actually feeling like a lot of um, anxiety points because of so much that I was like receiving through my field but just kind of go 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 so um yeah, a, a, a learning of how to rest deep on Noah and start to move from a different space. So, mm. so when yeah. you were starting to open up and the senses was it sounded like through yoga and meditation, et cetera, that you were starting to open up the senses and maybe take in more stimuli, but also still working hospitality. Did it feel yeah. at any point on that journey quite overwhelming as your perception of reality is shifting but you're still kind of, yeah, working hospo, for example. Yeah, I mean, I was quite gifted in that I was working in like a whole food cafe called Naked Treaties, which had superfood powders from all over the world. And like the owner of this was Peruvian, well, she was Australian, but she worked a lot in Peru. And so she kind of, she had the cacao uh, transmissions with me and I would go to those ceremonies. But sure, that's the challenge because I think, again it's like that brushing up against this whole new way of relating to life but then um also for her owning that business and then needing to fit into the matrix mainstream system of like we're still nine to five I got to get my coffee fast I got to do this and I want my smoothie in five minutes and it's like so you want to talk of these like really tapped in conversations and then suddenly I'm like and I think I got to the end of the day and was like holy fuck like that is so much energy that I've just been tapping into all day and yeah it's taking me years years to drop out of the mind that's telling me no you just need to work this job because you need to pay your rent and stop whining and just get in and do it and then this other side of me that's like I need to move slow and listen to tune and follow the energy and um mm. Yeah, so I but that working in hospital I get, gave me that opportunity to not be in jobs of like high responsibility. I could really focus on my yoga and my spiritual path, and you know it was it was there were a lot met a lot of amazing fun people. But I will never work in hospitality again because it's taken years for me to actually like not operate from fight or flight. Or when people talk to me. And I'm like, oh, like I'm with you, but I'm also not with you because I need to make like all these coffees and like, I've also got to go do this and do this. And so it's like the presence was, I was struggling with that just still mm. to be with where I am and who shows up, you know, to have a conversation. And mm. so mm, uh, I definitely feel, yeah. Now go ahead. What, what you were going to say? I'm um, moving between these different environments of um, like being in like the, the a yoga room or a ceremony or out in nature and then like that jolty feeling of then like fast tracking into like the supermarket or you know, now I work in education and how do I um, hold myself and find the languaging and find um, my inner 
strength and power to have that level of awareness but still be able to maneuver through the the noir realms that society is operating in at this stage so yeah mm. so noir that's a word i'm not familiar with what does that refer to uh that's um te reo for normal so uh-huh. you know you can say tapu and then the noir is like the normal every day which is also can be incredibly beautiful it's like cooking the kai lighting the fire collecting the water but also you know and all its you know, maybe mm. getting up and going to work and needing to fill those obligations and responsibilities of paying rent and and tax, you know, fill the car mm. up with petrol. <laughs> when- <laughs> All the things. So what was your family, how was your family making sense of your journey as a young woman, given that you'd gone to university and obviously you, you got a degree and then here you are over in Australia doing ceremony, doing yoga, doing ecstatic dance, working hospo in like a wild foods cafe. What was the family thinking? Oh man, it wasn't just like the immediate family. It was just like my whole circle of people that I grew up with. It was just like, what's B up to? Like, where did she go? <laughs> because I just, there was this energy in me that and burn away everything and like the freshness pretty confronting because I moved to Byron and I knew nobody but I knew my soul was on this journey and I was like I just need to separate for a bit to to just trust in where my heart's guiding me and the kind of people that you know I need to relate with in this unfolding um but I think it was challenging for my family for sure because you know there were points that um I've I'm that that bubbly Rebecca that would come home and like you know have all the jokes or have friends over and we'd be on the have wine and you know like a, quite a um yeah enthusiastic but also underneath those layers I I was kind of probably a bit performative to just that was like a coping mechanism for me hmm. um and when I you know especially having some quite deep experiences in Bali would come home to Lake Tarawera where my family had a batch and you know we have a big family and having family dinners and going and having you know a beer or whatever and I was just like chanting in my room (laughs) 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 and accessing this like kundalini shakti wave that was through my body and it was like I can't come up and like eat a steak right now like I'm in something um so I remember this point I remember it super vividly where I realized that my life had changed and the lens at which I'd seen things through was changing and I was struggling at that point to relate to people that were you know my best friends and my family and I could no longer fit into the kind of conversations they were having, especially because I come from, you know, a farming family background and I feel where my cousins are talking about the price of this ca- this cow or the land or and, and I just um kind of checked out a lot. Like I remember sitting at the table being quite mute, just kind of, fuck, what do I even say? And there's actually no space for me to say anything. And I don't think they're, at that point, like it shifted now, I don't think there was a receptivity within them to actually ask about the journey that I'd been on because it was maybe so foreign for them to actually open to and understand. And so, uh, yeah, there's just had this very vivid memory of um, going out in the boat with my cousins and um, coming back from that experience and being in the kitchen with my dad. And I just started crying. It was just like crying. And he's like, what's wrong and I was just like I don't know how to be here right now (laughs) and of course that would make no sense to him he would be like what do you mean you don't know how to be here (laughs) um so this this new lens I think this is really um worthwhile exploring because what I notice with people reality humans is that some people are not even aware that they have a worldview or that they have lenses or filters with which they, that they filter reality through. Right. Um, Yeah. So that's the first thing is like, a there's a lot of people that have no idea such a thing even exists. And then for those of us like yourself or like me that have had a dramatic shift in worldview, 
we know there's such a thing. And I also think for marginalized people or for people of color, um, you know, for mm. Maori people, they're very aware that they have different worldviews and lenses that are often othered or shut down or perceived as um, as inferior, et cetera. Yeah, so that, that see, how would, did you ever talk to your family about the shift in worldview, about what that means or? I mean, I don't think I had at that point those conversations, but it was just very natural in the way that I was speaking that they could see that I was seeing and experiencing through a different lens. And, you know, it was too lost. So I felt like I was kind of in the higher range of it, like hard and getting really excited and like being like, oh my God. And, da, 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 da. and I think they were at points like, I don't know, like, what are you talking about? But when I, I felt actually like, the more that I've embodied and felt deeply humbled by life and by um, the teachers that have walked with me, I, it's not like maybe coming through so much in the conversation, but just in the way of being and, mm. you know, sitting down, having meals, and I would really like to offer a karakia or, um, you know, saying to dad hey I'm going to go down and sing some water prayers um and so they've really understood how important those practices and that way of being is for me and there's a huge respect that I'm experiencing mm. to the point where I go on little adventures with my dad who I have a really amazing relationship when he's actually without speaking to it directly being quite supportive of my path and um yeah, going out in the boat with him at Tarawera and we were told about this amazing obsidian stone that was on this red beach and we went over together and we were, I, I offered a karakia and then we walked up together and we were looking at these stones and it was just like really beautiful experience with him of coming out and him saying, oh, I would actually really like to learn a karakia, you know, can you, mm. you know, share it with me more and about the, um, asking before you take and being a farmer that was never there you know in their way of living but now he's to that farm and he's on a different journey he is really receptive and um he loves now when I bring friends to the lake and we we share in different ways and there's there's a vibrational frequency of you know not so much of the way of relating is around talking you know because they're really intellectual and and it's like the, the the room just feels noise and talking. And that's cool. Like they're, you know, they are having fun and there's so much play within how they're unpacking life together. But um, when it comes to it's like somebody's got the hand pan out and somebody's singing a song and somebody's dancing around the room and we like candles and incense and we just take over. And then my dad and my stepmom are there and they're like, oh, yeah, so nice. <laughs> 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 I love it. It's, it's like been the, the merging. Mean. Yeah. That's the really merging beautiful. of the world and seeing them. Yeah. 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 It's been really special. Brought my dad to my birthday where we've done a water ceremony before, and he's actually just been like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, you're like operating in this, you know, new kind of way together. And he's like kind of intrigued and there's something in him that gets it. And that's when I'm like, don't need to speak to it directly because he's just seeing it from the, yeah, the way we're naturally relating in the space. Mm, so, yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that, that sense. Because, I mean, it's starting to become really apparent to me as well. I mean, obviously from the work that I do, from being at festivals, et cetera, is, and I'm almost like, do we coin a term like energy natives, like those of us who orientate towards energy and don't use as many words or don't come through the mind, but are really responsive to energies in the space. And what I've been really curious about is this apparent separation that people talk about between, they use the word mainstream or, or matrix, 
And then those of us who are operating in these ways and how these things will merge and inform and influence each other. So when I listen to you share your story, B, what what strikes me is that it doesn't sound like you were ever trying to convince or persuade or recruit your family. It just sounds like you were doing you and showing up and they got curious and and open about what mm. was happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think being the huge gift of, you know, when I work, first started going through this opening, awakening journey of feeling like, man, got to wake people up. And then, you know, also patterns of me hiding a lot and not engaging in the conversation and being judgmental and doing an us and them thing. And da, da, da. and I think now just merging more in this heart energy of like, mm. I just want to meet people with where they're at. And like, everybody has something beautiful to offer and we're all on this path and we all have different ways that we are going to experience how our whole moves this life. And if that's where they need to be, that's cool. But like, you know, I, I want to be, able to be receptive and 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 open to everybody's gifts that come through in that moment mm-hmm. without boxing and labeling too much and um mm. so that's been a gift I've been experiencing lately but then also you know like it's been too long sometimes in some of those spaces and needing to really refill with some of us that are just in it together and we recharge and it's a relief too there's like this sensorial way of relating and we can unpack threads and go into those um those spaces that we do um yeah I'm grateful for some of the festivals and and workshop environments that we can learn Mm. new new pieces and so yeah yeah. they feel really important that sense of like oh it's it's almost like a safe space we're like oh I can just relax and be totally my spontaneous flowing energetic multi-dimensional self without needing to hide things or explain things or pretend things or whatever it is um yeah so you, uh, what happened after australia what happened after australia because obviously you're back in new zealand now yeah. and i know we talked about the fact you've been working in education how did you get from hospo ceremonies awakening journey kundalini to working as a dance movement therapist mm-hmm um well dance has just been the most phenomenal space for me to explore play shift energy emotionally release free anchor download you know what's coming and I was just feeling fascinated by the whole ecstatic dance five rhythms open floor movement and also noticing within myself how deeply I started connecting to the nonverbal languaging and the um the body sensorial awareness and how I can be on a dance floor with somebody and that I mean you and I are always in the festivals <laughs> and I was like this is just such a safe space to um explore without needing to go into the head and talk and um why why aren't we dancing more like I was like I was like I was like this I was just like we need to be dancing more with our feet on the ground on Papatua Nuku and shaking things off and um and so it kind of led me after living on Waiheke for four years and being really ingrained in the community and um, needing some more kind of psychotherapy based mental plane understanding and awareness of um, what how did how to guide people there gently Mm -hmm. that maybe are needing some therapy and obviously like the talk therapy is the main um, river at the moment but for me when I was going through spaces where I did need a lot of support I just didn't know how to explain Hmm. to a therapist what I was experiencing and feeling like are you gonna think I'm crazy or you know I just actually want to like howl on the ground and like (laughs) shake this off (laughs) it can be okay (laughs) (laughs) and I'm gonna howl now just gonna howl (laughs) right because we're animals we are animals (laughs) the primal 
Yeah. The uh, so yeah, I, I was living in this sanctuary space called Wingsong, and I was noticing um, living in those kind of um, spaces. It attracts a lot of people that come to heal, and a lot of people that maybe come to transition into a new space of relating and experiencing. And I felt like I needed more tools to understand how to work with the languaging and understand the threads of um yeah what was going on for people before delving into the sex so the dance therapy gave me a container of um uh, yeah of working with people with the art dance and the talking through it and with the art therapy you know having space to say hey I'm, I'm working with this uncomfortable emotion or um you know I've had this trauma with a past lover or from my childhood or whatever and you know talking through it gets to a certain point but then I noticed when I put on music and I said hey well let's move that together and move that through your body and putting paper down and then them having the opportunity to work with different colors and and paint or use crayons or whatever to bring that through and then stepping back and looking at that and then unpacking from there and it's like there's as we know there's so much yeah with us that has an innate body intelligence that needs some space to unpack in different ways and I actually didn't realize when I I chose to study that how deeply it would move me into working with tamariki and working with what in the you know more mainstream realm calls disability but I see it as gifts um and working with autism ADHD um yeah tamariki that have worked you know had really rough upbringing and a lot of um I'm not saying I'm anti-medication but it's just I can see that some of these systems and structures ne- need to keep working with this trajectory of what they have the, pr- the pressure from higher up with the curriculum and the school system structures and you know the teachers need to fit into that and the majority of those classes are still inside sitting down and my um initiations have been in working with these gifted kids that are sometimes non-verbal um experiencing a huge amount of like dysregulation in terms of just either being almost kind of down because of the overwhelm sensorially or like going breaking out and like kind of becoming dysregulated and just trying to latch at something and find an edge for them to ground and land back into their body and feel safe to be experiencing what they're experiencing and um they've just I've just been wow it's been deep humbling to be in that realm with them and feeling like um being somebody that's quite sensorily sensitive myself you know working with music and working with creating an environment for them to feel comfortable in and you know sensorial toys or they need to grab a a shaker and move the energy off and um but also learning a lot around structure of how important structure is to hold those therapy sessions or or to hold a container for the kids when you're working with um trying to support them to improve their communication and their regulation and things like this and so um you know for me I'm 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 kind of would just love to take them all into the Nahiri and and do a bush school and um yeah like eat amazing food that's growing in the garden and and have it a lot a lot more free reign um to let them kind of direct a little bit about what they need with some structure and space but I also have a lot of respect I want to say for schools that are um, more and have um, amazing resources available to um, find the right languaging and the right that child's experiencing and that's what they're saying it's like this child isn't naughty this child's dysregulated right now and what's going for them behind what Mm. they're showing them and that's what the principal's been speaking to and that's what you know I'm noticing in my conversations with the teacher and I was working in a school prior to the one I am in now and I wasn't finding that and it was like I got to a point where I was like I can't do this work anymore because it's so heartbreaking for me to see what can be done and not being done and that there's a lot of numbing out in those environments and then for me even to kind of 
be in there every day. I mean, I was working five days a week. So at point, I was holding my light, but at points there was a kind of a numbing out just to kind of cope in a way. But um, the this, this school that I'm at at the moment, um, yeah, there's a lot of receptivity to ideas that I have and new ways of doing things and just seeing how everybody's feeling really stretched. Like everybody looks, you know, mm. is feeling burnt out and trying their best, but nobody really is fitting this system and the structure within education anymore. And it needs to have a total reshuffle. Like, yeah. so for us to really rebuild, because the, the kids are the ones that are coming in to teach us and listening more to what they need and where they want to move and what they want to learn. And you know, for people, for teachers to have a level of awareness of the connection to spirit and the soul journey to mm. support the direction of um, how can thrive on this earth not just survive um so yeah I guess that has led me to seeing the way I want to work is going to be more like coming in and doing activations and doing sessions and and I'm already been doing holiday programs and things like that so I can take them on that journey and, and work with these schools skills of dance therapy but mainly all of the other initiations I've received with indigenous wisdom and um slowing down and for them to feel that those around them are in that well-regulated like not rushing to get anywhere space too so they can be like okay cool like here we mm. are just listening um, to you and you're talking about um the challenge for you to go into the space the challenge for you to go in without numbing out the challenge for you to go in and noticing you're starting to just cope that makes me really curious because if you as the educator are having these challenges in these spaces, then no wonder the children are having a lot of challenges showing up and being in these spaces with whatever they've got going on. It's like, if you can't yeah. do it, how on earth can we expect children to do it? <laughs> Absolutely. So it's just like observing that the space that a lot of the teachers are finding themselves in as well. And like, you know, partitioning for, and and trying to create different structures and systems within they've been given um but yeah just it hurts my heart a lot yeah. because I've done a lot of women's work and about slowing down and connecting to mental cycle and you know being able to not have that second cup of coffee and put some music on and shake and have an ecstatic dance and you know the staff and, and I just know that there's other amazing ways and I, I sometimes I feel like on the, the precipice of like hey <laughs> did you ever do that did you ever like put some music on in the staff room at the school and just do a little ecstatic dance for five minutes dude listen to music I'll put my headphones in and I'll just like rock in a chair and like sometimes I'll stand up a little bit and the gift of being like the you know dance therapist like working with the new like oh you know she's doing a thing she's like regulating <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I often go and sit like herbal tea and a pooted tree and just like lie under it and ground and like people are like, oh, where were you at lunch? And I was like, I was just singing under a pooted tree. <laughs> That's <just what> <laughs> it's so funny because this stuff is what we need to regulate our nervous systems and to take care of the level of stress and trauma that a lot of people are experiencing. And yet it's still seen a little bit weird. It's like, wait a second. So I'm weird for knowing how to drive this mind body interface. Like, aren't you guys the weird ones? Cause you're not actually attending, you're not topping up your oil or putting in your gas. Like what? <laughs> yeah. I think that's been the biggest challenge for me is when we are meditating more and we're operating on a, a, a high, um, I'm trying not to be like higher or lesser, but yeah. like a level more, of consciousness. More expanded. You know, yeah. You, expected know that we have the power to create our reality and a new reality and the lagging and the way we speak to things really directs that and so when I get into the staff room or whatever in particular environments and everyone's like oh I just can't wait to get to the end of the week to have my wine or like you know the last hour to go or like before we got through that school term or it's all of this like we just need to get through energy and yeah. And, and that's there's like this unlying like oh, made it like blah, 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 kind of and I'm like I can't subscribe to that like that's <laughs> <laughs> I love it so, excuse me excuse me I can't subscribe to the worldview that's being expressed in the staff room right now 
Yes, it's like, hey, what do you do, need right now in this month to make this a really fun day? And, you know, it doesn't need to be that. I just yeah. need to get that coffee. So, um, yeah, to be honest, like, incredibly challenging and took a lot of time to adjust. Like, I, I realized that when I worked in the school in Hawke's Bay last year that I hadn't been working in those kinds of environments for years. Like, living yeah. in Byron, Bali, being, living in sanctuary spaces, women's temples, like, deep in those ritual environments, working with, you know, wisdom keepers. And, um, but I, I had the sense when I was working with the dance therapy that I needed to understand those spaces and I needed to understand how to relate in those spaces and not come into like you know like trusting in what you feel needs to be given but coming in with a humbleness and how to relate and yeah. and for them to actually get what you're doing and why you're doing it and why that's good for the tamariki and for them to build that trust and so it's been incredibly valuable incredibly valuable but I mean you know like I've had conversations with you of my challenges and feeling like man but yeah I'm definitely probably in a transition out of being in there so much and and working in other ways but um I mean the kids just like what do you call see? me yeah what do you see in the children that are seen as neurodiverse or whatever the particular label is because I heard well, you say really that the, you see it as gifts rather than disability for example but yeah what are you seeing in these children well Rudolf Steiner has some amazing transmission on um you know with disability for lack of a better word I mean the English vocabulary I just struggle with in general it's like <laughs> it's a lot really repressive and like wrong or right um but what I'm seeing is that some of these kids are really here on quite a deep soul journey initiation for whatever they've you know come or have come in and and needed to experience what it's like to be in that level of I mean I see them in a lot of pain too but also just the the sensitivity and the um like uh, to sound and to yeah. um particular touch and I'm just been observing feeling like you know this journey that they're on of really not se separating or segregating and seeing it as a disability but like such a curiosity of like what they're experiencing and how you can meet them every day and look them in the eyes even if they're not able to speak to you directly and communicate that I'm with you like I'm with you here on the soul journey like we're in this together like what can I do right now to make an hour of your life that bit better because mm. we don't know what we come to this earth to learn and where we're going next and um I just feel that because of their sensitivities it's going to naturally start to shift these spaces into higher vibrational frequency yeah. because you know the schools are like square walled some of them and this is a generalization I guess I'm speaking to this particular school I was in because I don't want to bash because I think there's people doing amazing work within there but it's just like making these environments aesthetically beautiful and having art and having um, beautiful cushions to lounge on and having space to dance and express and paint and creating more space for these particular children and other children that need more of that sensory feedback and support and um yeah mm -hmm. I I think that they're supporting us to shift into a more of a vibrational awareness of energy than just coming straight from the mental academic plane and the rise of like the ADHD diagnosis is just off like it's rising and it's off the roof and I know it's like to do with food and kai and you know potentially I, I'm not saying that parents that have AD, kids with ADHD that that they have done wrong or anything but it's like there's a a level of which people are operating that is just so busy that the presence is lacking to actually hold the children to feel safe and what they're in so they don't need to like be latching at everything under the sun and their nervous systems are going like this and then they're diagnosed with ADHD and then they're put on medication and then da 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 and so yeah like I think these the food and the environment and all these pieces if they were 
improve, then I'd like to see if the, uh, the ADHD diagnosis is, yeah, can be looked at in a different way because what the Western model is just always trying to label everything and, and like not attuned to actually understand people kind of on an individual level and what their needs are. So it's just easy to be like, oh, you I hate this child's ADHD and it feels really limiting and those it just feels old like it's like a system that's Mm. outdated Mm. what I'm getting curious about as I'm listening to you is that what if we are experiencing a shift from material reality perceived through the mental plane because most people still perceive the world through their mind through thinking about life but those who've had awakenings are often more sensorial beings where there's a direct experience of meeting life and all of its awesomeness and ickiness, mm. right? And mm. my what I'm curious about is if that's the human evolutionary journey that we're on from going from being more mental to being more sensory, those kids who have these sensory sensitivities and are coming in, they're, they're almost like ahead of the game. They're, they're the ones who are already there, but because of the way the construct is currently set up, they're, they're perceived yes. as, as having a problem where it's like, yes. actually, they're just ahead of you. And you we haven't yet caught up to what they're perceiving and how they're interacting with life. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeing is it's just like they're coming at a higher frequency they're needing more support to be in that frequency so they don't numb and go into lower kind of depression and places they don't feel that they can be in that and so yeah um, it is the challenge um so i mean man imagine if you know teachers training starting to work more with kind of awareness and that you people were developing the programs to support um, yeah more like embodiment a... embodiment and then awareness and self-reflective ability and all of those things that we all do in the so-called spiritual world as such um, it, I mean I do see that coming into the so-called mainstream I mean the, again I don't really like using these labels either because it makes it into an either or and it's not that yeah. in the slightest yeah. but the way yeah. that yoga and meditation etc has started to penetrate um, and things like this, like dance therapy and music therapy and art therapy. I mean, they've been around since, well, you know more than I do because you've studied it, the 60s or so. But it feels like they're getting more traction now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. And like, especially, I think dance therapy is emerging, but art therapy is very present now. Like I've noticed that like within school, some of the kids are seeing art therapists and music therapists and other dance therapies emerging. And I think some of these are amazing with working with kids to process information and, um, yeah, create spaces for them to really release what they need to and 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 have a safe space to just, whew. Um, yeah. So I'm seeing that a lot, like, within the, the mental health realm and um, with talk therapy and everything that things are starting to shift and the, the recognition that we're mind, body, soul connected and when you start working on the body and the nervous system and, and releasing yeah. that energy and those blocks and then the mind is a lot more harmonious and stable and clear. So yeah, um, it's exciting. It's a really exciting field for us all to be navigating. And um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm up for, I'm up for it. <laughs> so if you were to look forward like 10, 20, 30 years, right what would your vision be in terms of how we perceive or work with multi-dimensional children I mean all children are multi-dimensional I just want to say that <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah you know yeah 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 it's just some are having more challenges than others and in integrating some are better at being the good girl or the good boy right that's not yeah. necessarily yeah, totally. a healthier thing exactly. in the long run with the autism ADA to also be operating at that level it's just potentially they can access you know a bit more regulation and mental plane understanding but um what would I see yeah what, what would your vision <laughs> be down the line entirely <laughs> yeah man um 
Yeah, I feel like really seeing um, these sanctuary environments coming where um, we're not, where people aren't needing to operate so much out there to to work and get money to pay for rent and not have the family unit solid and around them and the grandparents there to just hold that love and presence and also to support the whānau with, um, with the tamariki. And I see it being deeply connected to the natural world and having, you know, beautiful vegetables growing and it feeling really abundant and full, like picking a fig off the tree for um, morning tea time and going down to the river in the morning and collecting water and kind of starting to move more with the natural circadian rhythms of nature and then taking class outside, going into the Nahere and learning different pieces or wanting to build a new little house or something and how does that come to life and how can we bring learning maths into that space and that it's like purposeful it's not sitting down and you're writing down like how to learn maths and how to read and then an elder you know is stepping forward and reading the story and there's like this beautiful weave that they're like supported with other people that kind of around them holding them in this nest and the learning is fun and enjoyable and well held and um you know there's there's space to also if there's something going on emotionally to like pause and there's somebody that's there that can st- speak to that with them and then they can come back to do the learning mahi when they're ready and um yeah I'm not like saying like full commune living necessarily but there's definitely um I just see more why being able to come back into the home again but in an empowered way to to be the medicine mamas and be weaving the kai and collecting the herbs for the tea and the kids can come in and the, there's amazing cook cookies that there's just like a mm. a full openness to um to play with life that they interweave with and are curious with and if they're like oh my god I just saw this epic bug on this tree and then somebody's like cool like let's research this bug and then maybe that's for your next pro so it's coming it's mm. uh, it's coming from like that alive almost nothing space as opposed to having everything stand down what class is going to be taught and then da 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 and like emerging from them emergence um, yeah an, an emerging way yeah. of educating to life and that they are brought into that system so then they move out into the world they've got this really strong foundation of feeling well loved well held and that those around them are seeing them and hearing them and then they have everything that they need to give them for what they want to create in that project so they move life with that relationship so it's not a lack I'm not enough I need to be doing this career and I need to be pushing and da 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 because you know that's really dangerous when we're still live up to the expectations of our parents or feeling like failures from the school system or whatever else but it's that foundation in those early years is really important. Mm. Um, I can feel so. that. It's got a whole different felt sense to it if we were educating in that way. Um, mm. You yeah. just mentioned going down to the water and that reminded me, I'd love to talk about the water and the water ceremony before we close off our conversation. Um, so are you, mm. are you, you learned water press from Melissa Billington? Yeah, so um, Melissa Billington obviously is a dear, dear friend of both and I, and I met her when we were living together in Tutorangi. And um, you know, as you know, I was going through a bit of a death cycle in that phase of my journey of um, breaking up with a partner and feeling like, man, how do I live <laughs> this reality? <laughs> and, I needed some strong practices at that time and she well you gifted me an amazing tantra meditation and then she put in my kettle water prayers and I would just go and sing to the water with her every morning and then that that came through of me singing for every day for probably six months and then you know after that three days a week and now I don't 
I'm not in that practice every day, but it, they just sing me throughout the day now. It's like such a deep relationship that I've learned with connecting to the water and the prayer and the giving and receiving reciprocal nature of how we relate to our natural environment. But those, that particular ceremony was gifted from Grandmother Nancy, who gifted it to Crow, who gifted it to Melissa, who gifted it to me. And it's such a long line of um, wisdom keepers that are kaitiaking and, and holding the, these medicine songs in this prayer. And for years, they these prayers weren't released because of the potency of them and that the elders didn't feel that we were ready yet to receive them. And now I think we're in a time where we are. And um, they say we need more people, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what color their skin is, to be singing to the water. Mm. And, you know, it's always a journey as a Pakeha woman of receiving indigenous teachings and having a really strong affiliation to Native American wisdom and singing those songs um, of, you know, feeling like, oh, well, you know, who am I to take on this ceremony? But um, Melissa has been so beautifully guiding me in that of like, you know, this is, this has come to you and, you know, you've been embodied in singing and in that space and that also, um, maybe speaking to a little bit of my challenge of when sometimes these songs can be overused, um, especially with the excitement now of as we go to festivals and, um, and our own women's circles and there's like oh my god I just I've got all these songs and I want to sing them and I want to be seen in that and it's like that's beautiful but also like these are prayers and they're they hold particular frequencies and they're an entity within themselves and they're really powerful and let's not dilute them like let's bring them back into that ceremony and take a pause before the next one and I just feel more and more passionate from the transmissions of Melissa that's been passed down to her of to not dilute and um, hold the prayer and, and drop into that prayer and sing it for yourself first and sing it to the water first before you share them. Um, mm. But that's been a massive programming for me of how I start my day, you know, like instead of, you know, I mean, I do like coffee now and then, not going to lie, but, you know, in general, a lot of people get up, have their coffee, have brekkie, go. And it's like, hey, you know, starting down by the water, and the, and the ceremony and our gratitude for the day and um, offering that that song out and then seeing how that ripples into your relationships and into the ways you weave the water and life and in your work environments and that that is behind you as you start your day because you've had this very beautiful experience of, of looking to the water and singing that song and I mean we all know like you as well you're so deep into your practices that can hold us in these openings and awakenings and this commitment to feeling that we can do things in another way and um just to keep yeah. realigning and entering within our to to step back out and be like okay this is the level at which I'm experiencing how can I shop today um that that mm. sacred cause how has it changed like working with the water ceremonies how has it changed the way you perceive or relate to water Oh, just really understanding that that that, that the water is alive it's mm. this living breathing system and um even just looking out on the water and feeling like a little emotional and just um seeing it like the the goddess and seeing it like this incredible energy that moves and shapeshifts and creates different colors and um you know I live on Waiheke and I go down to um Palm Beach and I offer my prayer before I enter and to be held so deeply by the water just to lay back into that mother water love and know that you're you are loved and supported and then from that space feeling like a commitment and a yeah, feeling a commitment and a devotion to being able to offer spaces for people to cleanse their waters emotionally mm. and yeah. um, and drink 
clean, pure water because that's what we're taking into our bodies and that's where we're moving from. And meeting each other um, as friends and having these different, our waters are speaking, you know, like if we're just always from up here and and this safety of like, I know all this information and da, 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 but when we meet each other and let our waters speak from that heart and that depth, what unfurls and what unfolds and the pieces we unlock together and it's like we're living beings of water vessels and we carry lifetimes of wisdom and I think the more I spend time by the water in that deep listening of just pausing and listening to the hour and listening to the listening to the roar and receiving um this a subtle energy I um I just feel that the waters then start guiding me move in a in a different kind of way and it's just so it's just continually unfolding um mm. in terms of what Melissa has gifted to me and what Mike's the the support of Mike and his mahi right now um to really really re-remember and um allow the waters to to start speaking and, and moving and ask um so yeah like it's funny because a lot of our friends are on this water carrier mission it's like well what does it mean to be a water carrier like carrying clean water carrying medicinal tea you know spray bottles if we need to clear the air and then then we take that into other environments and support other people like shift and shake and move and mm. remind them to to drink clean water and eat good kai and the nourishment aspect mm. Water is life. Water is everywhere. It's and everything, it's everything that we're right. everything. I find it really we curious. That, yeah, <laughs> we the, love <laughs> um, find it really curious that right now in Aotearoa, in New Zealand, that three waters has been such a big contentious issue, etc. And what do I want to say about three water? I don't think anyone's said much about water as a being as such do you have any reflections on it from the perspective of someone who does sense and feel water as a being what would you love to see the government do with something like three waters that's now called something different they've just changed the name of it i think it's water reforms or something mm. yeah i would really like to see more um indigenous leaders or leaders that are sensing and feeling in this way in those spaces to have a voice and to or those that are in those positions of power that are bringing forth these rules and acts and laws to um, understand how to relate in that way that how destructive it is when we go in and think we can plan and um, kind of control and make um, particular um threads of of doing things to step back and have that level of awareness and it does take a while you know so yeah um, it makes me it wonder like they're, yeah they're doing like 10 different entities and it makes me wonder I'm like oh I wonder if there was a water prayer person for each entity that would say the prayers for the waters in that district I mean I, I can just imagine yeah, the yeah. newspapers would have a field day talk back right and they'd just be like this is crazy this is weird this is blah 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 and yet to have a person in each area that prays for the water I mean how if, oh wow right <laughs> to be hold that and say I'm gonna hold that poem um and send those spaces like Mike does with the way yeah. he carries the water and and he has been in those env environments and he's done incredible ceremonial work. And, you know, people don't fully understand it. There's been deep shift within the energy of that meeting mm. and an awareness, you know, like that sacred pause I was telling you about the energy just kind of down and it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, where were we? Oh, <laughs> maybe we can have it tonight. This was, <laughs> that was, of peace that was needed so I mean yeah more leaders that are speaking for water and praying to the water and having that level of awareness is would be something I know that I'm going to see it in this lifetime because I already yeah. am and there's yeah. a lot of people that are start moving into spaces and bringing this message and 
not live in fear or anything anymore and it's like it's it's time for us to merge and talk more and listen actually more <laughs> listen oh, more it's time for us to listen more yeah so yeah mm. Well, it's been a delight to listen to you, B. Thank you so much for sharing, not just your words, but of course, your whole beingness and the way that you move. I'm so grateful for the fact that you came and lived in my house in Langholm and that we are now connected and so grateful that you are doing the water prayers, you know, the way that you are and you, you receive that from Melissa and honored it and are now stepping forward in it. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been beautiful to share words and 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 vibration and water and yeah, it's been really um, awesome to see my journey. So thank you for having me here. Hmm. Loved that interview with Rebecca Gunson. Um, I I just love listening to the way that she speaks and can really feel her respect and honoring of indigenous traditions and the bodies of work that she has done and the way that she holds the ceremonies and the th songs that she has been gifted. And I love the fact that she's been working in so-called mainstream schooling, education, and, you know, just having those experiences of seeing what's going on, seeing what's needed. Um, and this is an edge that I'm really interested in because I feel like, do I feel like, yeah, as, as a human that went through a huge awakening and then felt so separate from and so different from regular folk, now I just feel like, oh, it's just the advanced guard, that's all. And I see people all around me who experience reality now the way that I do, which is, it's sensory. It, it's a felt experience. It's not through the mind. I'm not thinking about things and I see this in, in people like Rebecca and in Melissa and Nina Kay and you know many of the the guests that we've had on here are perceiving reality through a different worldview and often it is an indigenous worldview it is a different way of looking that's actually a really old way of looking and when I feel into our world and the journey that we are on as humans my sense is that those who have extra sensory perception which is ultimately going to be all of us that's a real gift and it's going to be needed because we need to make some pretty big changes in order for people to thrive in our communities and I think we're at, we're moving towards a crucible where we're kind of going into the underworld you could say and the thing about going into the underworld, for those of us that have done it, right, we go down into the underworld and we get tested and it can be really, really scary and bad stuff can feel like it's happening. But always, always when we go into the underworld, we come out the other side. And when we come out the other side, we are different. We've grown, we've expanded, we've learned, and we always come out with the boon, with the gold, with the thing, you know. Um, so I have, you know, when I look at the world, I just... I don't want to say the word hope, but I have an understanding that the shifts and changes required are not going to come about through the mind. They're not going to come about because we're trying to plan things, because we're trying to control things. Um, they're going to come about through emergence, through the felt sense, through a different way of operating in the world, which we are starting to see. All right. My name is Carolia. Thank you for listening to and or watching another episode of Conversations with Carolia. I'll be back next week or in two weeks time with a brand new guest. Not quite sure who it's going to be this time around, but I got some pretty cool people who are waiting in the wings. Make sure, of course, to, you know, like, share, follow all the things. Oh, I'm not on Facebook anymore. So if you could do me a favor and if you're in any Facebook groups that feel relevant to this or any of the other conversations, please share, particularly the YouTube and all the, the uh, Spotify links in the Facebook groups because that's where traction happens. But I just, I couldn't do Facebook anymore. Um, and I'm kind of missing out on that major uh, form of promotion. So if you guys could do it for me, that would be amazing. All right, big love to you all. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Carolia. And trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. 
If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.